Okay, so we're gonna um, talk today about posture and gait assessment um, on our patients. So to start off with, when we look at examination of posture, we want to use quantifiable measurements as much as possible. And so this allows us to compare um, our current patient to um, fairly normalized standards. And then also it helps us to track progress in our patients as well. So one of the things that's important to realize is that posture can have both direct and indirect roles. So we may see some very obvious postural um, deviations that clearly are related to a patient's um, primary complaint or is kind of setting them up for um, you know, malalignment or faulty biomechanics. Um, or posture can be a little more indirect and a little more kind of under the radar. So it's important to um, be able to tell the difference between the two. We also want to make sure that we assess posture in both um, sitting, so we want to have our patient um, seated and standing posture. And it's also important to have both static and dynamic posture. So with patient in standing, we're going to look at them, you know, um, anterior, we're going to do a posterior view, and we're going to do a lateral view. And we've got landmarks for all of those that we're going to talk about. Um, in terms of dynamic posture, you know, maybe it's going to be important to have um, patient do a running um, evaluation, and we're going to check out um, alignment when they're running on the treadmill. Maybe we're going to have them even just walking through the clinic um, or moving through a certain movement pattern that they do during the day. Um, you know, if it's a shoulder patient, maybe we could have them raise their arms um, to see their scapular movement um, combined with their glenohumeral movement and, and see how that looks. So it's important to have them moving as well um, as, as standing in a more static posture. Um, when we look at examining posture, we can use objective tools. I mean, this is certainly something that um, is accessible if needed. And so this is going to be more like x-rays, like radiographs. Um, you can certainly take pictures of your patients um, with their permission, obviously, um, to be able to compare like a, a pre-treatment and a post-treatment um, type of um, type of comparison. I've even had patients, it's not really specifically posture, but I've had patients in the past, like especially when, um, when people come in with more of a dynamic valgus issue with excessive dynamic valgus, and we spend, you know, four weeks, um, six weeks strengthening up um, glute need, and then we come back and I'll have them do the same movement again. Maybe it's a jump down from a box um, or even or walking downstairs. I'll have them do it again and I'll recheck and we can actually on the screen kind of draw that angle um, so that we can see um, our progress in that area. There's certainly um, computer tools um, to analyze this. I honestly haven't used any of that in the clinic, um, but of course it's out there. And I mean, even just something as as simple as an iPad to film video and that way you can even show it to the patient um, and so they have an idea of what you're talking about too. We're going to focus more on clinical tools. Um, plumb lines are definitely something that 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 you can use and so basically these guys are going to hang from the ceiling you know it's going to be a straight line and you usually have like a weight at the bottom and then you can have the patient stand in relation to that line and it, and it helps you to um, assess their patient and kind of give you a visual reference. Um, goniometers are going to be um, used, rulers certainly, and then this tool right here, this is called an inclinometer. Um, this is something that we are going to be using these to measure uh, cervical and um, lumbar range of motion, so you'll get, get a chance to use those in the class as well. So in terms of our posture exam, um, one of the things that we want to do is certainly we want to start with the patient's history um, and having them describe their onset of symptoms and then take a look and see, you know, kind of what matches up, what correlations can we find between their postural uh, deviations and how they're feeling. Um, if you look at 
postural complaints, they tend to be more um, insidious onset. And so this means that there may not be a specific, you know, identifiable, oh, it happened this day, I did this. Um, you may not hear that from your, from your patient, um, and that's okay. But if you see complaints that may be more insidious in nature with a gradual progression that comes on over time, um, one thing to consider is posture. You'll also see that these certain patterns of, um, of pain and of, uh, of complaints will kind of start to appear. So um, a lot of times the pain will worsen during the day. So maybe like the longer they do the activity, the worse the pain gets. So it could be standing, you know, if they have a job where they're standing eight hours a day or um, um, if they're sitting for a prolonged period of time at work, like that sort of thing. You'll also see that specific postures cause the pain. Um, I have patients that I see um, in the clinic that maybe they change jobs and now they have a different desk with a different chair and it may take a couple months. So there's your gradual progression, you know, a couple months in their new chair and then they start coming in and saying, you know, my back is really bothering me. I've never had this problem before. Um, so you can kind of think about that. Um, in most cases, the pain is intermittent. It can be somewhat vague um, and kind of diffuse and that it may cover kind of a large area. They may not be able to pinpoint um, the location exactly. It doesn't mean that they don't have, um, you know, significant complaints, um, but it may be that it's more um, kind of a, a diffuse type of nature of that pain um, and also be an intermittent. So maybe it happens while they're at work, but then they go home and they can work out and do everything else and it's just fine. So it's just maybe something to do with their workstation. A lot of cases what you'll see is that their overall trend um, is that their pain level is increasing. So um, you'll see that it's kind of getting worse. So this, this tends not to get better without intervention. Um, in terms of mechanism of injury, that's something that we want to um, obtain from our patients. How did it happen? Um, any kind of changes. Again, it's often insidious, so your patients may not be able to point um, like no specific onset, you know, not any specific injury, but just kind of a general gradual onset. Um, and so that's where this is important. Any change in routine or positioning. So did they change their chair? Did they change their workout? Um, did they start taking a new exercise class in the gym? Um, did they go from doing free weights to kettlebells? Um, did they increase their mileage, you know, a significant amount? And maybe they weren't prepared for it. So all of these things um, can contribute. You want to know any kind of change. Patients oftentimes will say, I don't know, I didn't really think it was important. I started taking a yoga class. Well, okay, you know, that may be it. Maybe it's not, but it could be. Um, make sure that you ask them about their current level of exercise, you know, and you want to be specific about what they do. So when we have patients come in, I want to know what their gym routine looks like, you know, because that's something that over time I may want to watch them um, lift to make sure that their posture looks good when they're doing deadlift, because that may be their problem right there and we can fix that. So current level of exercise. In terms of pain, you want to know where it is, um, and so that's where our body diagrams come into play. Um, you want to get a type of pain from them, so how does it feel, and then severity of pain. And so this, is, this could be your visual analog scale um, or your numeric um, pain rating like we talked about last week. You want to know um, what is your patient's dominant side. So if they're right-handed, a lot of times the um, right shoulder will be depressed on the dominant side. So right shoulder depression. Um, a lot of times we'll have scapular protraction on the dominant side. 
And a lot of times we'll have um, iliac crest elevation on the dominant side. That, that dominant side hip tends to sit up a little bit higher. So all of these are normal variations that you see with, um, with posture, um, just based on dominant side. None of that would be considered necessarily pathomechanical. Um, and then a past medical history, obviously on all our patients, we're going to want to know um, any significant past medical history that could affect their treatment. Um, so when, when taking a history, basically this is going to help you decide whether their postural dysfunction is related to their current issue. Okay, So it may not be, but it very well could be. So you want to investigate all of that. Um, certainly, we know that repetitive tasks can um, can lead to overuse types of injuries, and this is not only just job related; that this is sports related too. So, if if you have an athlete who is repeatedly doing the same um, task over and over again, and and they're in a position of malalignment, that could lead um, very easily to an overuse type of injury for them. Um, and so that's why it's important to, to figure out, okay, what do they do every day um, that could be causing issues because it builds up over time. Um, this is an example that I wanted to point out. Th these are glove boxes, and where I work at BWXT, we have lots of people who work in glove boxes like this. This is just a picture I pulled off um, the internet, but this is very similar to what they do. Well, I oftentimes will have patients come in and they'll either be really tall patients, so they have to kind of bend forward and like slight flexion all day to work in these glove boxes, or they're very short, and so they have to kind of reach up because these, these you know, holes here where they put their hands are set. I mean, their height is set. So we have a therapist who comes around and does specific ergonomic workstation um, assessments and recommendations um, at all of these workstations for patients, but it is a pretty common complaint to see these guys come in, um, you know, and they'll either have, you know, maybe back pain or they'll have neck pain. A lot of them will have shoulder issues just because, for one thing, they're standing in one place all day and they may be in a slightly awkward position that um, ends up causing issues over time. So this is um, a list of factors that might uh, be responsible for um, influencing posture and possibly in a negative way. So how are these things related? These are these are factors that you're going to want to look at and just kind of tuck away in the back of your mind. So obviously we can have neurological um, issues and an example of that would be if you had um, long thoracic nerve that was being um, impinged or irritated in some way that may lead to winging of the scapula. Um, just because of serratus function um, not being up to par, and so you get a little um, excess movement of scapula away from the rib cage, um, muscle imbalances. So if you have a patient who comes in, for example, with weak abdominal muscles, you know you might see more of a um, lordosis in their lower back. That's a terrible lordosis, but. If they if they have um, increased abdominal mass combined with decreased abdominal muscle strength, it could certainly lead to um, more of like a lordotic posture. Hypermobility in joints can be seen, um, for example, in junior record bottom, um, and in that case, you would want to look like other areas of the body too may be affected as well. They may have um, hypermobility throughout. We can also see hypomobility, um, so a decreased um, available movement in joints, which may lead to um, more of a contracture type of situation. Decreased muscle extensibility, so we'll oftentimes see patients who come in with um, tight muscles. Hamstrings is a really common one. So tight hamstrings, um, where you're going to see in that point, in that situation is the hamstrings are going to pull the um, pelvis into more of a posterior uh, rotation. 
because of their attachment at the ischial tuberosity. And so posterior rotation of the, of the pelvis, and it's basically going to lead to um, a decrease in lordosis or like a flat back type posture. In terms of bony abnormalities, you may see kind of some compensatory um, postures related to this. So if someone has um, internal or external tibial torsion, so you've got a little bit of um, rotation or torsion in that tibia, then you're going to see they're either going to toe out or they're going to toe in based on that. And sometimes you'll see tibial torsion in relation to um, what's happening at the femur, um, maybe some femoral torsion, and then your tibial torsion is kind of compensatory um, for what's going on above it in the kinetic chain. Um, leg link discrepancies can certainly cause um, functional scoliosis. We'll talk about that in a minute, but that's going to be a um, kind of a compensatory curvature of the spine. Um, pain can cause um, postural abnormalities. So let's say that you have a um, nerve root compression in the lumbar spine. You may see that a patient's going to come in and they're going to be kind of like side bending away from that side to, to help kind of relieve the pressure um, on that nerve root. And then a general lack of postural awareness. These are those patients who come in with just kind of bad habits, like they kind of slouch or they spend a lot of time at their desk on their computer. Um, and so that may be uh, a contributing factor as well. When we are assessing posture and doing our inspection, it is really important. You need to be able to see as much as possible. So, you know, within reason um, for your patients, you want to be able to see as much skin as possible. Um, and I think you can either start at the head um, or the feet or the head, work your way up or work your way down. I tend to start at the feet and work my way up, um, but that's just how I do it. I think it's important just to be consistent, to you know, kind of always have your kind of landmarks mapped out and then also be systematic. And so I think either way is fine as long as you're consistent with it. Um, you do want to protect modesty. You want, to, you want your patient exposed. You want to be able to see the landmarks that you need to see, but obviously you want to take into account their modesty as well. So certainly pulling the curtain around, um, making sure that you're not in a busy area of the space that you work in. You know, be, be cognizant of that. Um, patients definitely appreciate that. Um, tell them to take their shoes off. So no shoes because you want bare feet. Um, just tell them you're taking a look to see, um, you know, how things are lining up. I don't really say, like, I'm going to look at your posture because everyone inevitably, like, kind of straightens up a little bit. So it's not really a true um, indication. And we talked about um, either starting at the bottom or the top and working your way um, up or down. And then you also you always want to compare bilaterally with landmarks um, because it gives you a comparison. And then you want your eyes at the same level. So this is where it's important. Like some of this, you might be crouching down in front of them looking at their fibular heads or their lateral malleoli. Um, for iliac crest, you might be on a stool um, at kind of at the same height as their iliac crest. And then for scapula, you might be standing behind them looking at it. So you're going to have to move around a little bit, but you do want to be, you know, at the same level as the structure that you're, that you're looking at. One of the first things that you're going to notice when you assess posture on a patient is their body type. And this is kind of starting kind of grossly and then moving into specifics. So we can take body types and we can divide them into three main types. We've got um, ectomorphs, which tend to be thinner. Um, body types, maybe if you think about these guys, they're going to have um, maybe less muscle bulk. Uh, their joints might be slightly more mobile, so maybe a little bit of an increased in mobility um, or maybe even some hypermobility. Um, mesomorphs tend to be more muscular. Okay, and so these guys, you know, they may have um, normal joint play, 
uh, or they may have a little bit of um, a little less joint play than the ectomorph would um, coming in. It kind of just depends on the person, but you would expect maybe less joint play than, than the ectomorph um, with the mesomorph. They may demonstrate some muscle tightness just because they've got more muscle mass, especially over two joint muscles. Um, and then endomorph is going to have um, a little more adipose tissue. Um, they're also going to be, um, tend to be more on the muscular side of things and then a higher um, percentage of um, adiposity as compared to your mesomorph. Um, endomorphs tend to have less joint mobility overall, um, but again, it's going to fluctuate a little bit. So kind of depends on the person too. So here's some more examples too. So your general impression when patients come in, I usually tend to document their body type because it helps me to um, kind of get in that mindset of what am I going to expect to see? You know, I would expect an ectomorph to have more joint play than an endomorph, right? So for them, that's going to be kind of within their normal, normal range. So what are you expecting to see? And then what do you, do you see what you expected? You know, and that's where your comparison is going to come in. Okay. Um, when we do our postural exam, we're going to do um, observations from the front. So we're going to do anterior, we're going to do posterior, and we're going to do a lateral. You need to know the landmarks that you're looking for, um, and then make good use of a plumb line. We're going to get a little practice doing this. Um, but basically, here's your landmarks, and I'm going to give you a list um, of these landmarks. So you need to know where your lateral landmarks and your anterior and your posterior landmarks are going to um, need to line up in relation to that plumb line and then be able to document deviations that you see. Uh, one of the deviations that we see in the postural exam that's a fairly common is leg link discrepancy. Um, I'll commonly write this as LLD. So leg link discrepancy and you know leg link discrepancy it's very common most of us are walking around with one leg a little longer than the other so it may not be as problematic as you think. In fact, there was one study, um, Grundy and Roberts showed that um, a leg link discrepancy of up to two inches didn't have any bearing on whether that patient complained of back pain or not. So it can be problematic. In other cases, it's not as problematic. It really just depends um, on the person. So that's something that you kind of have to figure out. You can assess leg link discrepancy with imaging, um, or there's also clinical tests that you can do. And here's one of them. This is um, to assess for a functional um, leg link discrepancy. And so this is basically a difference in leg link that is not caused by either the tibia or the femur um, being longer or shorter than the other one. So this is more related to muscle tightness or weakness. Um, you can have knee hyperextension that's a little more prevalent on one side than the other. You can have a scoliosis that's going to affect um, iliac crest height. And then typically you'll see some pelvic asymmetry. Most of us have an asymmetrical pelvis a little bit. Um, and so that may, um, that may contribute as well. So measurements for this are going to be um, umbilical, umbilicus to um, medial malleolus and then you're gonna assess on the other side too. So that's your test for functional leg link discrepancy. You can also have a structural leg link discrepancy. Um, and by structural, we mean that there's actually a difference in the length of the tibia or the femur. Um, and so this is something that you can measure as well. Um, some people are born with um, just differences in length. Other people, um, maybe they sustained an injury before their growth plates fused, and so they had um, disruption of their um, growth plate, and so growth in one um, of the bones stopped a little prematurely. You know, it can happen for several different reasons. Landmarks here are going to be ASIS to medial malleolus, um, and so those are the landmarks that we're going to use. These are other tests that you can see if you have um, patients lying down, we call this hook lying. So they're lying on their back with their knees up. 
um, and you can assess femur length. So if you see a difference between um, between the legs from the side, from the side, that's going to be looking at femur, right? So we're looking at distance here compared to the other side. Um, if you're looking at them from the feet on, then we're going to look at height here of the knees. So we're looking at distance here and distance here. So if we look at it from, um, I would say this is more of like an inferior view. This is going to be looking at tibia. So tibial length. Okay. And so that's kind of visually a way that you can, that you can assess. You can also um, assess for leg length discrepancies using these blocks. This is called measured blocks. So you'll have these blocks that you know the, the height of them. Um, they are of a known height. And you're going to have your patient stand, and you are assessing um, iliac crest height and ASIS height. And then you're going to have the patient stand on these blocks. You kind of put them underneath the foot of the, of the side that's lower to try to build it up. Um, and that way you can, you can actually get a measurement on um, how much of a discrepancy you have. So something to think about. I mean, I don't always fix leg length discrepancies because in a lot of times patients, they've had it their whole life. They've compensated for it. It's probably not really an issue. It really just depends, but it's it's always something to look at. So in terms of um, posture exam, we've got um, points of palpation, and so these are going to be anterior landmarks that that you should know and be able to palpate. I've got posterior landmarks um, that you're going to want to know. This was actually a patient of mine um, from BWXT. If you can you tell. A difference between calf muscle mass on the left and the right looks pretty different to me right so he's got some significant atrophy on this right side and that's because he had a um, total full Achilles tendon rupture uh, and then went in and had um, surgical reattachment of that Achilles tendon and if he uh, um, if he didn't have his shoes on you would be able to see a real kind of difference in the angle of his um, Achilles tendon and calcaneus here. So that's something that I would look at. I always start at the bottom and work my way up. So I, I kind of start at the feet and look at, to see how the calcaneus um, is aligned with each other and then kind of go up from there. So those are landmarks um, posterior and then we've got landmarks laterally um, that we're going to assess posturally. Um, it is important to note that not all postural deviations cause pathology. So sometimes we can see postural deviations that are just there. They are asymptomatic. They don't, they don't cause any trouble. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. So that's kind of what I think about that. So you can kind of, you know, people can kind of fall into these three different categories. They can either have normal posture where everything lines up really nicely they can have deviations, but the key point here is they are asymptomatic. doesn't seem to be causing any trouble at all. Um, or they can have postural deviations, you know, that lead to pathomechanics. So these are the guys that we're going to want to um, certainly treat and, and figure out what we can do to help them. So... It's hard, you know, I think students, they'll come into the clinic and they'll be like, well, what do you think about this? Or, you know, is this always something that we want to treat or that we always want to fix? And everyone hates it because we always kind of give them the same answer. It depends, <laughs> right? It's very much an art and it just kind of depends. So you just, something that you learn over time, um, but we try to do the best that we can and give you um, skills to be able to to work with that in the beginning. Um, I wanted to talk through some specific postural um, dysfunctions that we see related specifically to the spine. Um, hyperlordosis is one of them. This is something that um, that you see fairly commonly and so what you're going to see with this is an increased lumbar lordo lordotic curvature. Um, this is commonly brought about by 
patients who have tight hip flexors, so they're going to have shortened hip flexors here. Um, maybe there's someone who has an increased abdominal mass, so they've got all this anterior weight that's kind of pulling them forward. Um, that can also um, be tied in with abdominal weakness. So maybe, um, you know, maybe we've got an athlete who's postpartum even, and so abdominal muscles are all kind of stretched out and they haven't gotten um, the tone back to them yet. And so they've got some weakness and maybe some extra um, abdominal mass more than, than what they're used to there that could be pulling them into a position of hyperlordosis. And that kind of changes the mechanics of the spine. Um, so that's a common one that we see. Um, kypholordotic posture. So this is basically um, an increased lordosis. And then as a compensatory um, curvature, we're also going to have an increase in kyphosis. So we've got increased kyphosis, increased lordosis going on. And a lot of times with this, we're also going to see um, forward head posture. So like normally um, his acoustic meatus would line up with a chromium, but you can see here, you know, he's got a forward head posture as well. So lots of opportunities here um, to correct some postural deviations. Uh, sway back posture. Okay. So this is, this is a pretty common. Um, what we see here, it's going to be mainly the picture of this, um, of this center person. And we're going to see an increase in um, lordosis. We also see a kyphotic curvature here, an excessive kyphotic curvature here. Um, we also have kind of a forward head posture. Okay. Um, and then we also tend to have hip extension. So the hips are going to be, well, that's kind of exaggerated, but we're basically going to have them standing in a position of hip extension. And I always call this hanging on their ligaments, okay? Because you've got those um, Y ligaments on the anterior hip. So basically anterior hip ligaments are being stretched here because he's basically standing in hip extension and he's putting stress on those um, Y ligaments. So you've got this heavy reliance on ligament support um, at the hips. Oftentimes with patients like this, you're going to see genu recurvatum. So you're going to see kind of a um, hyperextension at the knees and they're commonly going to be in um, a position of posterior pelvic tilt in addition to that. So sway by posture, definitely, um, definitely a common posture, and we see this quite a bit. And then flat back posture, uh, this extremely common. So flat back posture, what we, what we have here is a decreased um, lordosis because basically what's happened is you'll see this very commonly with patients with tight hamstrings or very shortened hamstrings. So their hamstring length is tight and where their hamstrings attach to the ischial tuberosity, it's basically like taking their, if you kind of picture his pelvis, it's taking his pelvis and moving it downwards. It kind of gives you a posterior, or not kind of, but it gives you a posterior pelvic tilt. Okay. So it's basically pulling the pelvis downwards here. And what that does is it ultimately flattens out the lower back. Okay, so they're going to have a flat um, lower back. And um, a lot of times with these patients too, we kind of see a flattened um, kyphosis as well. Like it's not really um, your normal curvature in, in, in any aspect of the spine, but um, kyphotic curvature tends to flatten out as well. Um, but with these patients, a lot of times we see that typical forward head posture, right? So he's got um, forward head posture as well. So very common. We see this a lot in patients who sit a lot during the day um, because hamstrings get tight. Um, we tend to see this um, with a lot of patients who have tight hamstrings. I mean, I, you know... This is, this is fairly common. 
okay? Scoliosis. Uh, so this is um, going to be a lateral curvature. When you look, um, you know, this, this would be a PA view of the spine. Um, it's going to be a lateral curvature, and um, along with the curve, we see a torsional um, rotation of the spine as well. When we name scoliosis, it's named for the region. So whether it's thoracic or whether it's thoracolumbar um, or cervicothoracic, it's named for the region and the side of convexity. So for instance, we could have a right thoracic scoliotic curvature, which means that the, so we've got, so for that instance, we'd have maybe cervical spine coming down. Um, we'd have thoracic curvature and then lumbar. Of course, it's never that clean and easy, but here's my concave part of the curvature and it's pointing to the right. Okay, this would be the left. We're looking at the patient from the back. Um, so my, con um, my convexity, my concave part um, is pointing to the right, and so that's how it's named. We can have um, both functional and structural scoliosis. Um, functional would be more like muscle imbalance, like if you have tight um, erector spinae on one side versus the other, or potentially a leg length discrepancy um, that's creating um, a height difference in the iliac crest and then the compensatory um, scoliotic curvature of the spine, you can certainly see that. And a lot of times that will resolve when you get the patient in a non-wavering position. So you may see it with them in standing and then you get them on the table and it goes away. And so that can help you um, to decide whether it's functional. Scoli um, structural scoliosis is based on bony anomalies and are most likely going to be identified through x-ray. We're going to assess this clinically in the Adams forward bend test um, and that helps us to determine whether it's structural or functional as well. So whether or not to brace, so according to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, um, they're going to brace if they see a 20 to 40 degree curvature, if it's a progressive curve, if they follow it over time um, and it's getting worse. It depends on the stage of growth of the patient, um, where they are, if they're still growing significantly, um, and then also if they have more of a 30 degree curve um, on initial diagnosis, then they will most certainly brace that patient. Okay, here's another um, specific posture dysfunction. This is one of my favorites. This is called upper cross syndrome. And so what we see here is basically a forward head posture um, and forward shoulder posture. So basically everything's forward and what you're going to see, we call this upper crossed syndrome because it creates kind of this X here. So what, what you end up having are tight pectoral muscles. So tight um, pec minor and major. Okay, shortened muscles in the front, and then the position that they're in, that forward head posture, you're going to have um, tight suboccipital muscles, so little tiny muscles here going from the base of the occiput down to the cervical spine, um, upper trapezius is going to be tight, levator scap is going to be tight, so all of these muscles are tight, and then at the same time we've got weakened muscles that, that are kind of stretched out um, and weakened and weak muscles are going to include rhomboids and lower traps because all of these muscles down here are kind of pulled and elongated and now you end up with like an insufficiency situation um, where they're not able to generate those contractions and they're very stretched out and weak um, because of the tight muscles pulling on them all the time. Um, and then you're also gonna have weakness um, in your deep um, cervical flexors that are supposed to be the ones that are active um, with the cervical spine instead of these guys. Okay, so we've got all these kind of muscle imbalances um, going on, but this is called an upper cross syndrome. So what happens here is commonly associated with this type of presentation. You can see impingement syndrome um, of the shoulders. You can have posterior capsule or tightness um, of the glenohumeral joint and then scapular dyskinesia. Um, so aberrant movement patterns of the scapula as a result of um, weakness um, and then also some tightness pulling on that scapula as well.
Okay. Um, it's important to note that different regions can have um, effects on other regions around them. So, I mean, you can have um, many factors at play. You can have poor postural habits that lead to muscle imbalances. You know, say you sit at a computer all day and you end up in this type of position, right? So there's your poor postural habits that are leading to muscle imbalances. You're going to have soft tissue dysfunction and all of these are going to result in pain. Or you can have kind of the flip side. You can have muscle imbalances and soft tissue dysfunction causing pain, which ultimately lead to um, poor postural habits. And it's kind of this cycle. So you have to like break into the cycle. Okay. So how do we do that? Um, when we have muscle balances, how are we going to, we're going to first of all measure our muscle imbalances. You know, are they truly shortened? Are they weakened? And if they are shortened and tightened, what's going to be our treatment for that? Well, we're going to want to elongate that muscle. Okay. And so we're going to have a variety of ways that we can do that. Or if we have um, a different muscle that's inhibited and weak, how are we going to want to treat that? So your main treatment for that is going to be more to strengthen that muscle. So, you know, in this case, we keep coming back to this guy, but what are we going to see in here? Well, we're going to want to stretch out all these posterior um, cervical muscles. So stretch out suboccipitals. Maybe we get in there and do some manual therapy. We're going to stretch out pecs. Um, and then on the flip side, we're going to want to strengthen the deep cervical flexors. We're going to want to strengthen, really hit those periscapular muscles um, really hard and strengthen them up. And the side effect to all of that is going to be a reduction in that forward head posture, you know, without the patient even having to think about it. Um, so if we stretch out the tight muscles and strengthen the weak muscles, um, then hopefully we get everything back in, in good alignment and, and the pain kind of takes care of itself. Okay, um, the second part of this is going to be talking about gait cycle. And I just want to bring, a, a, bring up a couple things with gait cycle. So with gait cycle, we basically have um, um, stance phase, which is about 60% of the gait cycle. And then we have swing phase, which is about 40% of the gait cycle. Okay, so on each limb, you're going to spend more time in stance phase um, than you are in swing phase. Muscles that are important, I've highlighted them for you here. And these are things that we're going to um, talk about as we're going to watch and assess each other's gait um, during our lab. Um, but basically, one thing to keep in mind is that when you have eccentric um, contractions um, of, at the lower extremity, I want you to think more like shock absorption, um, controlling the joint. So a lot of times those muscles are going to be contracting eccentrically in order to slow it down. Um, concentric, concentric contractions are going to be more propulsive um, and accelerating. So you're going to see both. Sometimes the quads are going to contract eccentrically. Sometimes they're going to be concentric. It depends on the phase of the gait cycle and what they're happening. So basically with um, stance phase, you've got um, abrupt loading of the lower extremity and increasing ground reaction force. And so it is important um, to have good muscle strength and specifically eccentric um, strength and control in order to attenuate that shock, especially if we've got somebody who's running or somebody who's landing, maybe they're a gymnast, um, and also to maintain stability. So here are the key points um, that you're responsible for with the gait cycle. So ankle dorsiflexors are basically going to be active, you know, from this point of initial contact where you're um, hitting down with your heel, and then your dorsiflexion, dorsiflexors are going to be active, lowering down your foot um, to hit the ground so you don't have foot slap every time you hit uh, your quads. Initially, they're going to be active, especially with initial contact, because they're going to um, slow down the rate of knee flexion here. So they're going to be controlling knee flexion. Um, and then once you transition your weight onto that limb, they're going to um, contract concentrically to increase knee extension. So here we're moving from a little more flexion to less flexion, more extension, and here we're at extension. 
Um, the hamstrings are primarily going to be um, active here. So at initial contact, hamstrings are going to be active eccentrically con to control um, uh, knee flexion. Glute max is going to be um, active to control hip flexion and pelvic stability. Um, so it's basically going to slow down um, hip flexion at initial contact. And then it, in conjunction with glute mean and men, are going to provide pelvic stability, um, especially when you look at kind of a, um, um, you know, like a hip hiking type of scenario. Glute mean is also going to provide some hip internal rotation because when we're in stance phase, your your um, the leg that you're in stance phase on is going to be slightly adducted as well as internally rotated. Um, and so that's going to be glute mean doing that for us. Um, iliopsoas is going to be a major player um, in terms of eccentric control of hip um, extension. And then ankle plantar flexion is going to be active here. You're going to see the beginning stages of plantar flexor contraction in order to um, toe off or push off um, as we get to the end of that stance phase. Okay, So we kind of have a lot of different things going on and um, muscle groups working um, eccentrically and then concentrically as well. Um, swing phase. So again, swing phase is about 40% of the gait cycle. Um, the hip is going from about zero degrees of, um, of hip flexion, so really at about neutral, neutral hip. And then as you swing through, we're going to end up with about 30 degrees of flexion at the hip. So it's going from like neutral, oops, neutral or like a zero degrees. Um, when we swing through, our hip tends to be in external rotation, slight external rotation during the swing phase. Um, and muscle activity, kind of the big picture that we tend to see here is iliopsoas as a major player. Um, as we come up from pre-swing and we start with initial swing as we're moving this leg forward, iliopsoas, oh, oh no, iliopsoas, sorry, is going to contract um, to pull that hip into flexion. Um, hamstrings are going to contract um, concentrically to initiate knee flexion. We're going to have ankle dorsiflexion here. So dorsiflexors are going to contract so that we're able to clear the toes as we swing forward. Um, and then quad contraction um, they're going to contract at terminal swing in order to start um, controlling the loading phase and control that um, knee flexion when we start to load on that on that limb. Okay, okay. in terms of observational gait analysis, um, typically we'll do this, we'll have patients walk in the clinic. Um, after we take their medical history and talk about everything that's going on with them, and then we do their posture assessment, typically at that point I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna, I just want to watch you walk, just walk normally. Um, and so what we want to look at is, okay, is there a relationship between the injury that they're coming in for and any possible dysfunctional gait patterns that they have? You know, is one causing or affecting the other, or are they completely unrelated? You know, it, may not have anything to do with it. So again, it depends, and you're just going to have to take a look at it. Um, the, the approach that I take with this is to identify impairments during your clinical examination. So if you have a patient who comes in and you assess a leg link discrepancy, and then you get them up and walk, and you can note um, changes in their gait pattern because of their leg length discrepancy or because of their um, hamstring weakness, see if it all correlates, if it all makes sense, right? And then correlate that with the patient's um, 
report, you know, what they're saying, does it, does it all kind of match up and make sense? And, and if you're lucky, it does, and it all makes sense, and you can um, know exactly what you need to do with it. Um, so I gave you some examples here too. So if you, if you have a patient who presents with an impairment of a leg link discrepancy, what you might think in your head is, okay, so this patient's coming in and they have a leg link discrepancy. So what I'm going to predict that I will see is in the stance phase, most of the times what you find is a compensatory pronation of the long leg and a compensatory supination of the short leg. Okay, so you may be able to pick up on those um, compensations during gait. In the swing phase, if a patient comes in with a leg link discrepancy, you may see a pelvic drop when the short limb is in the swing phase because it's almost like they're kind of like going over top of the long limb. Okay, so you might end up seeing that um, pelvic drop. Of course, that could also be muscle weakness too, but okay. If you have an impairment of um, hamstrings, <laughs> hamstrings are an impairment, um, depending on what's going on. So if you have weakness in the hamstrings, so you do strength testing and their hamstrings are very weak, well, what could you possibly see when they're walking? You may see um, a decrease in knee flexion um, during mid-swing because the hamstrings um, are weak and aren't functioning the way that they normally would and that may cause a decrease in step length on that side. Um, if you have a hamstring tear or some microtrauma that's affecting the patient or possibly even sciatic involvement because when you swing your leg forward um, and you're kind of at terminal swing, it's putting that sciatic nerve on stretch. So you may also see this um, with sciatic nerve involvement. You may see um, decrease in the extension so at terminal swing where your legs should be kind of, you know, f almost fully extended, you may see that they tend to keep their knee bent a little bit so that they're not putting those hamstrings on stretch. Um, you may also see a decrease in leg deceleration because the hamstrings aren't functioning the way that they normally would when you hit that terminal swing. So um, if you have hip external rotation tightness, external rotator tightness. You may see during their um, gait analysis, in the stance phase, you might see increased femoral rotation um, during loading. So this would be external rotation um, during loading, just because those muscles might be, um, might be tight, or even the capsule's tight, and it's pulling that hip into external rotation during stance phase, where normally in stance phase your hip would be slightly internally rotated. Um, in the swing phase, you might see an increase in the out towing during initial swing because um, either those muscles are tight and they're pulling the hip into external rotation or maybe you have some capsular restriction that's preventing the hip from going um, into internal rotation. Um, hip flexor weakness. So you've got weakness of the hip flexors. One of the things that you might think in your head that you might see with this patient is um, during the swing phase, they may have um, decreased hip flexion just because of the weakness during initial swing. Um, and they may hip hike in order to clear that foot because they have decreased hip flexion um, and they're gonna have a little bit of a harder time clearing that foot because of it. So you might see them kind of hike um, at that hip. So they're gonna pull in more like quadratus lumborum to kind of elevate that half of the, or that side of the pelvis um, in order to clear the foot. Um, in terms of gait deviations, if you have a shortened step length. So when you have patients walking, you can have them walk on the treadmill and you're gonna to wanna to like pay attention to the timing um, of their steps, I'll even kind of listen to see if it sounds like it's um, like it's even. Um, what you would see in non-pathological gait or a more normal gait pattern is equal step length and equal stance time bilaterally. If you don't see that, you could see a shortened step length, and this could be caused by any number of factors. You could have decreased plantar flexion strength, 
Okay, you could have decreased hip flexor strength. Um, you could have decreased quad strength and they're afraid to kind of load that lower extremity so they want to get off of it as quickly as possible. So it could be a lot of different things, but you're going to want to dive into that a little bit more. Pelvic drop. Okay, so um, what happens in, in um, this and on your Google Slides, you've got um, actually, nope, um, you've got this video posted. In a normal gait pattern, the pelvis is going to stay level as you're walking. You know, when you look at the pelvis from behind, pelvis is going to stay level um, without any visible drop when your um, stance time. What you're going to see with um, uh, weakness in the gluteus medius or possibly even a leg length discrepancy, you might see this as a gait pattern called Trendelenburg gait. So Trendelenburg is specific to weakness in the glute med. Um, and so what happens in this case is you have your patient and um, they're going to end up, glute med is responsible, if I can kind of draw, maybe here's your femur, this is, you know, here's glute med. Okay, and so it's responsible for maintaining your pelvis level as you shift your weight from one lower extremity to the other, okay? So if we end up having weakness, um, let's say on the right glute mean, as you are bearing weight on that right side, that glute mean is gonna contract to hold your pelvis level. But if that glute mean is weak, this glute med here, if it's weak and it can't do its job, what's going to happen is it's not going to be able to um, hold this um, pelvis steady, and you're going to notice that the pelvis is going to drop on that side, on the opposite side. Sorry. So you're going to notice a pelvic drop on the side opposite um, from the weak gluteus medius. You can also you can measure this with patients in walking. You can also have them just stand and pick up one foot and then pick up the other foot and see if the pelvis, are they able to maintain that pelvis um, level or does it drop on one side? Um, excessive knee flexion at initial contact um, and decreased knee flexion during swing, swing phase. So you're gonna see this a lot when patients have hamstring tightness, um, it's really gonna affect um, their knee flexion um, and it's also going to prevent them from achieving knee extension at initial contact from swinging that leg forward to hit initially on their heel. Um, so this hamstring tightness will kind of um, prevent that full knee, ex knee um, extension. If you have sciatic nerve tension, you're not going to like that position because it puts stress on that nerve. Um, and then also a piriformis syndrome. Um, for the same reasons, it's going to put stress on those structures. So you're going to see um, at initial contact, their knee is going to be more flexed than you would normally expect. Um, and then also, too, during swing phase, you may see a decrease in knee flexion um, as they're traveling through that swing phase. Um, a forward trunk lean. If you have patients who tend to lean forward more than um, you think kind of falls in that normal range, they could have a um, herniated disc, a herniated nucleus propulsive, propulsive, um, weak and painful hip flexors um, because they're wanting to keep those hip flexors in a shortened position. Um, and in conjunction with that, you may see a decrease in hip extension due to hip flexor shortening, and it's not allowing them to um, achieve full hip extension um, during the gait cycle. So we see that quite a bit too, especially hip flexors can be problematic.